Hey everybody, this is Rumble, and I'm Michael Moore. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, before we get started, I just uh, want to uh, comment on something that happened today. There were a number of things actually that happened uh, today uh, with the uh, pandemic. Um, the ambulance drivers in New York City uh, this morning were told that the overflow at the hospitals uh, are, is uh, so enormous at this point. Um, and the lack of staff due to the fact that uh, many of the doctors and nurses are now sick themselves because uh, in part of the lack of protective gear and um, uh, the other things that were needed from the federal government. And so um, the ambulance drivers were told this morning that if they get called uh, to a residence with a person who's had a cardiac arrest, heart attack, um, that if they get in there, uh, put the fingers up to the neck, um, uh, put the stethoscope on, whatever, see if there's a pulse. If there's no pulse, leave. Just leave the body there. Go. You're needed elsewhere. Don't bring that body to the hospital. Um, and that all you have to do is make sure they have a pulse or not. Now, you know, if you know anything about medicine, if you watch any of the hospital shows on TV, uh, you know that the heart can stop and it can be revived. That's why the ambulance uh, people are so good at this. The EMTs, they immediately uh, begin working um, on on the patient uh, right there in the house. They um, uh, they immediately try to revive. Um, they get them hooked up. They get them into the ambulance. They keep working on them in the ambulance, doing CPR, uh, uh, giving them the shot uh, to shock the system. Um, you know, hopefully they're just within 10 minutes of, of a hospital. Um, because you know, when the heart stops, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes later, uh, it is possible to revive. It's not usually what happens. Person has passed away, but they're not gone yet. The brain has not gone that long without oxygen. And so, um, so they give it to try it. As soon as they get to the hospital, they go right at it and try to bring that, bring that person back. It happens. Um, doesn't matter if it can happen now in New York City. Um, they're told to not bring the patient to the hospital to try to revive them because there's no room in the hospital and there is no staff, not enough staff to deal with it. Then an hour or two later, um, the doctors and scientists who have been studying this announced that it's not just coughing and sneezing in terms of how you can catch this. It is just simply someone near you breathing, exhaling, or talking, talking to you, talking to somebody else nearby. Uh, they now believe uh, that the droplets, microscopic, minuscule, remember 10,000 of these uh, COVID-19s can fit on the head of a pin. 20,000 can fit on the head of a pin. Very, very small. Can't see them with your naked eye. Um, the They now say that uh, you can contract this simply because of somebody near near you breathing. Okay, well, that's a game changer, right? And now we understand why this is spreading so fast, so many people. Um, so governors, not Trump yet, not no real direction from the commander in chief, you know, the war president, he says he's a war president. Um, but many governors now, uh, tonight are recommending that, um, people, normal, everyday people, you, me, wear masks when we're around people, when we leave the house, we shouldn't leave the house, but if you have to leave the house, to go to the pharmacy, to go to the grocery store, you got to put a mask on. It doesn't have to be a surgical mask. Doesn't be, don't, don't be using up the hospital masks. Um, you can use a bandana. You can, uh, uh, you can use, um, um, you can make one just out of any fabric, some cotton, cover the mouth and the nose, uh, put some glasses on, some sunglasses, whatever you got, ski goggles, whatever, protect your eyes too. You have to be very, very careful now with this. That, that was the other piece of news this morning 
And then as the uh, as the day ended, and I'm recording this now. This is I'm I'm recording this on um, on a Thursday night, um, and it's now uh, actually um, midnight. So we're going into Friday. This is Friday's uh, podcast uh, for Friday, April third. Um, and uh, as I told you, I'm I'm stepping it up here to to do this um, each day during the weekdays and possibly some on the weekends, but I just want you to know that um, you'll be able to find this pretty much around midnight uh, every night. The next day's podcast, I'll be posting it and bringing you the information that um, I think, I hope you need and can use and uh, giving you my commentary on how I, how I think what is really going on and, and what you can do to protect you and your loved ones and what we can do and think about now politically in terms of what, how we want this country to look when we get through this pandemic. And I'll tell you, something happened at the end of the day yesterday, or um, you know Thursday, uh, during the presidential press conference, the daily press conference uh, about uh, about the pandemic, and uh, they they uh, wheeled out the um, one of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the a- Admiral, I believe, from the Navy, and uh, to make a big announcement. So Pence brings him up to the podium, makes a big. Here's the big announcement uh, that right now they're loading on pallets. Um. 200,000 face masks for um, our health professionals. And they're going to fly that plane into New York City today. Land that plane and, 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 and then Pence butts in and he goes, help is on the way. Public health officials. First the, first the admiral said, well, you know, we'll get them to the hospital. And then the Pence had dinner. Oh, we're not going to go to the hospital. We're going to take them to, the, uh, to a warehouse. Public health, where, public health warehouse is what he called it. And then a reporter started asking some questions and then did some more research afterwards. And it turns out that the 200,000 face masks that are being loaded onto a Navy plane and landing here in New York City today, the they are not going to any hospital. This is a big lie. They just stood there and lied. They're not going to any hospital. You know where they are going to a warehouse. That part was true. They're going to a warehouse uh, because, uh, as the Admiral was forced to explain later, well, this is really a commercial effort. Uh, this is not a for the public health uh, the, a government uh, endeavor. This is, well, the government is helping private business. The government is flying this plane load of face masks to a warehouse near New York that will then um, go on the auction block uh, for private corporations to buy and sell these, including buying and selling and sending them overseas. There's absolutely no guarantee that any of these masks will go to the health professionals in New York City. And right now we've just begun the the initial seven day um, stint of as we head toward the peak. So as the Dr. Fauci and others have told us, in these coming days and, and in the next two weeks, we are going to witness massive death. And there is now no way to do anything about it. Even Governor Cuomo said yesterday um, he can't get the ventilators he needs. The factories, it's too late now. The factory started too late uh, to make them in time for New York. So they're just going to have to go with what they have. And they're trying to brace everyone for the um, tens of thousands of people in New York City that are going to die over the next few days, couple weeks. And they're going to die in part because our health professionals don't have the protective equipment and gear that they need. And no greater example of how awful that if a profit has to be made, even in this darkest hour, they're flying these face masks in today and they're doing it. They're flying them in for private corporations who will will then sell them uh, to the highest bidder, and that and they may or may not go to people in New York, and they may or may not go to Americans. They may be sent to other countries who've outbid the Americans who need them desperately right now. That is your government, and and they have got the U.S. Navy and the Pentagon participating in this. I have never seen a thing in my life. I'm glad my father 
who was a Marine in World War II, if he were to be alive and to witness our military working on behalf of corporate America, selling masks to other people who are not here and need them and who are risking their lives trying to save people who are dying. That, that is what's going on today, right now. God, I wish if I had the means, if I knew how to, I'd go out there and I'd, freak, I'd take a friggin' bunch of people with me. And we'd use our bodies. We'd just block them wherever this is, wherever this, wherever these pallets are. You're not taking them anywhere. You're not selling them for anything. You know, this country has a long history throughout all of its wars where Americans, capitalists, have tried to profit off war. And I mean profit big time to the point where they were willing to break the law. This began way back in the Revolutionary War. And after each war, you can, the history of this is incredible. They've had to arrest and put on trial people who 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 put the lives of our soldiers at risk and cost the lives of many, many of our troops because they were too interested in making a profit. They didn't, you know, they, they try to get by on fewer screws on the plane and the plane falls apart and falls out of the sky. And they find out later that it was a cost cutting measure in order to make a bigger profit, not to have to spend so much on the materials on the plane, guns that didn't work, guns that backfired. Although, I mean, there's just a whole history of this all through World War II. I mean, they would, they arrested people, but there's also the history too of American corporations. We're not going to get into this today. Maybe we'll do this at some other time of how General Motors and Ford and IBM kept their operations going in Germany all during World War II. Kept kept selling things inside of Germany and they set it up just before the war began so that the profits and the whole financial thing would, would be filtered through Swiss banks. So whatever money they made, it would go into a Swiss bank. So that's how, you remember Opel? Do you remember the Opel car? That was a, a that was that's General Motors. General Motors <clears throat> created a shell company called Opel, and they made cars uh, for the Germans during the war for the Nazis. It's a deal they cut with Hitler. Ford did the same thing. Coca Cola did it. You know Fanta Orange. You know the orange drink. That that was that was created by Coca Cola because they weren't able they weren't going to be able to get the Coke syrup and everything into Germany during the war to keep selling Cokes but they didn't want to go out of the soft drink business. So they created this orange drink called Fanta that the Germans would then be able to have soda and buy and sell soda and whatever profits Coke made from that would be quietly, secretly funneled into their Swiss bank accounts during the war. And when the war was over, all these American corporations, IBM, whatever, they used, they used, uh, they just went and took the profits that were made with the Nazis during the war. Oh, it's, a, it's a hell of a story. It's not one they teach us in high school. Because we want to love our corporations and we like our Coca-Cola, don't we? So, um, it's just, I'm sorry I'm so upset, but I just, I watched this and, and during that press conference and I thought, oh my God. And, the, and it was interesting, the Admiral sits on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He said, um, you know, I can't, I'm sorry. I don't mean to get in the middle of all this, uh, but, uh, you know, we can't, uh, we can't disrupt the, and he was trying to look for the word because the word is capitalism. Um, we can't disrupt. Um, uh, uh, and then he finally came, uh, the, the supply system. Yeah, the supply, the supply system. Capitalism. Don't get in the way of making a profit and use our army and use our Navy to help make a profit and make the, pro while you're making the profit, make sure you're making the profit by denying protective gear for our doctors and nurses in the hospitals. That's what's happening today, this very day. Your tax dollars, your Pentagon, your commander in chief, the war president, war president, Mr. Trump, you mean war criminal. And I can guarantee you um, when this is, um, 
when this is over and we're through this pandemic, I won't be the only one making sure that you are going to pay for this. You already know it. I hope you know it. You must know it. People, so many people are going to lose loved ones in the next few months. They're not going to forget it. You're worried about re-election? Forget about the election. You need to be worried about whether or not you can fit into one of those orange jumpsuits. I hope that's how you'll spend the final years of your life for what you've done. You've caused the deaths of our doctors and nurses and these patients who needed help from their government right now. And you dragged your feet and you tried to pretend it was a hoax and it was just the Democrats and the media after you trying to blow up, blow the situation up. And you caused the deaths of these people. It's called homicide. You couldn't just be, you couldn't have just been satisfied by being a sociopath or a malignant narcissist. You had to, you had to bump it up one more level to homicidal. None of us will forget this. Thanks uh, for listening uh, to this rant. I didn't really intend to. I'm affected by this the, the same way you are, those of you who are listening. Let me let me just turn the page here because um, what I want to bring you for the podcast today is a, a conversation I had um, in in the time before the pandemic. Um, I've been waiting to to share this with you, and um, and then the the pandemic began, and so we got busy with with all of that. But um, I think this is a today is a good day to just to take a break and. Um, share this conversation with you uh, that I had with Nathan Robinson. He's the founder, publisher, and editor of uh, the magazine Current Affairs. Uh, This is, as I say in this conversation with him that you're about to hear, uh, one of the best magazines in this country. I encourage you to read it. I'll put some links uh, on the podcast uh, page here for you uh, to um, check it out. Um, check out some articles, um, subscribe to it. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I learn, I learn, I learn things I don't know. And, and I read their analysis and, and, um, it's, it's very enlightening and they're all young. It's a, it's one of these, you know, millennial socialist, democratic socialist or whatever you want to call it, uh, that 20 somethings and 30 somethings are, producing these days, whether it's a, a podcast like Chapel Trap House or, or a Jacobin a magazine based in Brooklyn, or this magazine, which is actually based in New Orleans. Nathan um, grew up in the UK, uh, but decided he wanted to be an American. He came, he came here to help us. Um, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, I was grateful for the time I had recently in sitting down and talking to him about uh, uh, not only this magazine, but his views coming from the UK, from a country that uh, where the, the whole health system is run by the government, <clears throat> where nobody ever pulls out their wallet or a credit card or a, 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 a health care, health insurance card uh, when you go to see a doctor at the hospital there. And um, so, growing, so growing up and living in a system that you would define as social democratic or democratic socialist or whatever, um, and how that benefits the people of the UK, of Europe, other countries. Uh, so it was a great conversation to, to have with him. Um, he's also the author of a new book, Why You Should Be a Socialist. <laughs> and I can't think of a better time right now uh, than to share his, his thoughts. Don't run away from this. This is a, this is a good conversation. And, uh, and why don't we just, uh, we'll, head, uh, we'll head right into it. Um, so thank you, everybody, for being part of Rumble today.
it's it's I don't know how else to to live these days. We're in we're living in a time of utter and uh, painful dishonesty. Yes. Um, uh, but I don't. You know, let, let me just first of all, people are wondering who I'm talking to here. This oh, yes. is Hello. this is someone who I've admired now for a few years. He started a magazine called Current Affairs uh, a few years ago. Uh, he's the founder of it. He's the publisher. He's the editor. And this is one of the best magazines in the United States. I agree. <laughs> and it really, I couldn't believe when I read the first issue of it, both the subjects that were being covered, but the things that were being written about and said in a very different way than what you're used to reading, even, even in the kind of publications that you read and like and whatever that are, you know, liberally minded. Uh, uh, this was very different. And, uh, and it was called Current Affairs, which has just, that is like the most generic name. <laughs> that was you, intentional. It was intentional. Okay. <laughs> Very smart. chose that so that people would be deluded into thinking that we are mainstream, right? And also people do a thing where they pretend to have heard of it because it seems like the sort of thing that you ought to have heard of if you are a literate person. Yes. No, I, and I, I, I could, yes, because uh, I've actually said to people, um, do you read Current Affairs? Or have you read Current Affairs? And right away... Of I can they, uh, yes, yeah 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 of course I do. They don't want to seem like an idiot. And and no, the, I I could see that I know the difference, the look yeah. between yes, somebody yes, so who's no. actually read it. And uh, just like somebody will say, "Oh yes, I've read your book." Yes. Yeah, and then you just say one thing and yes. you realize, "Oh, yes. I haven't I've read I've been the reading book. it for years, they say. I love cultural affairs. I mean, current affairs, you know. Yeah, yeah cultural affairs. Someone, someone said that to me yesterday. <laughs> right, right. And uh so this is Nathan Robinson, mm. and Hello. um, and welcome. Uh, it's, to, oh, thank you to Rumble it's, here. It's my an podcast. honor to be. Uh, to no, be no, no, it's, guest. it's an honor to have you, uh, to have a conversation with you, and uh, I hope this will be the first of many conversations yeah. because I really appreciate your take, your different mm -hmm. way of looking at uh, things, uh, the writers that you put in your magazine that we maybe otherwise we would yeah, never right. have heard right from. Uh, um, uh, I also am very happy to, to see now having met you in person, uh, that you are not 60 years old, <laughs> no, no. no offense to the 60 year old people type people like me that are listening to this or whatever, but you, um, uh, uh, you, I'm, I'm guessing, are in your 20s still. I'm th I just turned 30. You just turned 30. Yes. Wow. I know it's not legal to ask that question during a podcast, but I just, I had to know this because yeah. I thought, well, this is, see, this is what is going to save us that, oh, that, oh that, gosh. that, no, I, I don't mean to put the burden. <laughs> well, that's quite. I know because really what, what people of the boomer yeah. generation that yeah. I'm a part of should be, yeah. uh, should be apologizing first of all. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the world that you gave us. Yeah. Really, uh, really did a great job there. I have been waiting for years <laughs> to, for younger people, uh, un, you know, under the age of 50. Yes. Uh, to get mad yeah. at this generation oh, yeah. of the over oh, 50 that I'm in. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm like, geez, these kids, they love our music. Yeah. They, love, they love our movies. They, yes. You know, and we, see, when I was your age, we did not like our parents' music. Mm -hmm. Detested it. Uh, we detested their politics. We did everything. Sure. We were against it. We love them. They're our parents. Sure. But it's just, and, and, and the younger generation, after, the first, the Gen Xers that came along uh, didn't revolt against us, mm -hmm. loved our culture, and now and then and then along he came had the some millennials. Good culture. Okay, granted, <laughs> I had horrible politics, but great culture. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, the music was pretty <laughs> yeah. good. Okay, all right, uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, and 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 great movies. Yeah, uh, great movies. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Okay. And I and I and I love this this one of these things that Greta uh, Thunberg is has said is that we should all be behaving as if our house is on fire. Yeah. Like literally think yes. right now, if somebody screamed fire here in the building, yeah. what would your right. initial reaction be? Your yeah. heart would start pumping. Yes. The adrenaline would flow yeah. and you would be looking for the way out, right. hopefully helping one or two people that might need some help on the way out with you. Yeah. Just saying. Which is why, you know, it is why a lot of people uh, are able to deny so much of what is going on because so many people who are, uh, extremely wealthy, spend so, so much time and effort 
trying to insulate themselves from the reality of the world, trying not to see things. And of course, you know, our our press enables them not to see things by not showing them things that make them uncomfortable. I mean, one reason that Americans don't have to think about the victims of our country's foreign policy is that they never see them. And the same is going to be true. And this is what's kind of disturbing about climate change is as the climate refugee problem escalates, there's going to be a, a real serious effort to just not look at it the same way we don't look at the people in immigration detention facilities, even though, or the people, in, the millions of people in America's prisons. We know it's there. And if we seriously confront it, we realize that it's, you know, a, a dysfunctional and cruel society. But, you know, you can, if you have enough money, not look at it. You can choose not to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, I, <laughs> that is what's going on, uh, certainly with people of a certain income. But um, y- you know, I think that the, I think the thing here is is that, um, well, let's let's speak a fact here. Mm. Um, for whatever reason, I think scientists know the reasons that the ice age ten thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago, that occurred. Um, that was a real thing. There were human beings before the ice age and there were human beings after the ice Mm -hmm. age. So the ice age did not kill off the human species. Um, and the earth, um, survived. Um, that may happen again. I when people always say to me, uh, Oh, we're, we're killing the planet. Yeah. Right. And I like, Oh, no, you know, I don't think the planet's going to die. Planet's pretty strong. (laughs) You know, who's going to die. We're going to die. Yeah. Planet's going to take care of us. Planet's going to see, that um that we are trying to kill it yeah and planet knows it's stronger than <laughs> us yeah it, planet you know yeah. has created and nurtured species yes and it has killed species yes and um you know the dinosaurs i didn't realize they went as quick as they did uh, yeah. mainly from the meteor that that hit Earth. yeah they were gone but boy they were, were gone fast <laughs> they went like that Yes. And, and, you know, I say, I think, God, how could that, how could we do that with Republicans? Like not, not have them die, but just all of a sudden, like we wake up, you know, like a lot of people yeah. went to bed thinking Hillary so, had won and then woke yeah. up in the morning. So and, what is the media? What's the media Republicans that would end the Republican? <laughs> I, I look, I'm not, I don't want a one party country. Right. But, uh, I think that the line has been crossed now. And I'm not, I'm not willing to allow people to run this government who don't believe in climate, that climate change is happening, yeah, right. who believe that people should work for $7.25 right. an hour, and who believe that a fertilized egg is a human being. Yeah. I'm sorry, you know, uh, science rules here, and you're wrong. Yeah. And you must not be in charge of anything that affects any of us, especially our children. So you have to go. Now, how do they go? Yeah. What's incredible is that we've we've had a one party country, kind of, haven't we? Because you yes. know, the things that you just mentioned, right? We've the, had the party the, of, the, of wealth. The Democratic Party has not had a climate plan. The Democrats have effectively been climate change deniers because they haven't, I mean, Obama is now bragging about how he expanded the fossil fuel industry while he was in power, right? right. I mean, it's it's incredible. And you say, you know, being okay with people earning seven twenty five an hour, right? I mean, you know, until Bernie Sanders came along, nobody was talking about low wage work in this country. Nobody right. was pointing out that, you know, uh, it, however good the economy is, is a, if you just look at unemployment statistics, if you actually look at the kinds of jobs that people have, they're crappy jobs. They're miserable, right. low-paying jobs. Right. And nobody in the Democratic Party wanted to talk to that. Of course, Thomas Frank's book is really good, uh, Listen Liberal, on, on looking at how the Democratic Party turned from the party of Roosevelt into the party of Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Um, but that's what you had. You had you had effectively a one-party state, and right. so that's what we don't want. Right. And the, what I've always called it, I've called it a one-party country also, mm. but the, the party, I've called it the party of wealth. Mm-hmm. And it, it, has, it has two divisions, uh, wealthy people who don't give a shit about anybody but themselves, right. and wealthy people with a heart. Yes. And, yes. but there's still, it's still being all controlled by people who hold the purse. Right. And, and I don't mean women's purses because there are no women. 
in charge of any of this. So um, it, it, we, the, the Democrats often usually, um, while they will vote for good things and do good things, are often beholden to the same people who give money to campaigns that they give yeah. to the Republicans. Right. And, and that's why you see so many of the Wall Street firms, for instance, they don't just give to the Republicans. They give the Republicans, they usually give more to the Republicans, but they'll give to the Republicans and the Democrats. I think Obama got more from Wall Street than... Uh, His number one private yeah. contributor was uh, Goldman Sachs, people who yeah. worked for Goldman Sachs. Yeah. So yes, that that is true. And um, so when that happens, if you have a system like that, uh, somebody like President Obama will try to do as many good things, yeah. good-hearted things as possible. But ultimately... Ultimately, on the big things that he could have done or needed to do, like yeah. health care, um, you know, he's lauded for Obamacare, and there's five or six things about Obamacare that are absolutely yeah. essential and wonderful. Yeah, but that doesn't it doesn't it, he put band aids on a problem that needs to be solved yeah. entirely, and we're not and that hasn't happened. It could happen. Yeah, as you said, if Bernie Sanders wins the election. Mm. I mean, just having a Democrat get the White right. House, you know, if it, I, mean, I mean, Joe Biden, you remember he had this quote where he said if you, to his rich donors, if you elect me, nothing will fundamentally change, right? Uh, like he said that as <laughs> if said, it was a good thing. He said that. He said, oh, right. don't worry. Right. Nothing will fundamentally change. And of course, any, all of, all of us <laughs> young sort of looked at that and went, okay, well, then you really, really shouldn't be president. It's interesting that you and I both in 2016 wrote things that said basically warnings we i mean i i wrote Not a warning basically in, you, <laughs> no seriously yeah, just, you and just i warnings. yes <laughs> were, were virtually alone yes out on a limb now now many people uh now will say oh yeah no i knew i knew trump was gonna win yeah but i never go heard look it back yeah go look back see because you remember the kinds of uh feedback that we got people thought we were crazy i first said it on bill Maher show and uh and i was booed by the yeah. audience yeah and um they didn't want to hear that. And I said, look, I don't want that to happen. Yeah. I hope I'm wrong, of yes. course. But you're sitting here in LA and the people on the other coast yeah. are, are in these bubbles. And, you know, I'm from Michigan and yeah. I'm telling you, he's going to win Michigan, yes. he's going to win Wisconsin, and he's going to win Pennsylvania. You said Midwest math. I mean, your magazine. Yeah. I, you know, do you know, I can't imagine how hard it is to do a print magazine these days and to be able to afford... Uh, to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're already, uh, you know, performing yeah. a great service at, at, I'm certain, little or no We don't make very much money. Financially. We, we survive, but we don't, make, uh, we don't make very much money. The good thing is print is viable. It's just not lucrative, right? So it's viable in that if you can build a small... I take viable. Yeah, yeah, I, oh, absolutely. If you can build a small subscriber base, you know, you can if get... If I can wake up in the morning and go, wow... <laughs> Viable, viable, yeah. Whoa. No, that's another I, I day. I mean, I do. This is why I'm, I'm very happy. I mean, I, don't, I have no complaints. Anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, I wrote a thing in, in February where, in 2016, which was saying, you know, it was called "Unless the Democrats Nominate Bernie, Trump is going to be President." And you know what I laid out in that was basically the problem with this was in early 2016. Yeah, February, February mm -hmm. 2016, yep. and then laying out basically like what would happen in a race between Hillary and Trump and saying, you know, you need to understand how Donald Trump works, what his appeal is, the kinds of criticisms that he's going to make of Hillary Clinton and the way that she's not going to be able to respond to them because many of them are true, you know, things like the Wall Street connections, Iraq. Um, and just imagine how these debates are going to go. Imagine what the news is going to be talking about. Imagine how this FBI thing is going to become just a huge talked about scandal, right? And Bernie has a sort of secret weapon against Trump. He's sort of, because he's able to draw attention to the one thing that Trump doesn't want anyone to talk about, which is the serious issues that affect people's lives. You know, Trump can't compete on that turf. You talk about, you know, you start talking about like how should your healthcare work, you know, <laughs> and, and, and Trump has nothing. He has absolutely nothing. He has no vision for, I mean, he just can deny the problem. So he denies climate change. But, um, you know, Bernie's able to have with sort of 
moral force. And you need a candidate who's able to counter Trump with real moral force, which a Democrat who has personal scandals and who hasn't really stuck up for things in their life um, just can't do. And that's kind of what I noticed. And that would be, you know, that I'd make the same point here in 2020 that I made in 2016, which is that you need to understand uh, the kinds of messages that Trump is going to be sending and think of how you're going to neutralize them and how you're going to take people's attention away from whatever Trump wants you to talk about and focus on what you want people to think about. I have this theory that one reason that a lot of old people don't like Bernie Sanders is because he shows what they could have been and should have been their whole oh, lives. Right, of right? course. Like he shows that when they were in college, they should have been getting arrested in the civil rights protests. They never. They do not want to tell this part of him, and I think you're right. Mm -hmm. A lot of those who now who are owners or run the media are boomers, aging boomers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't want to be reminded that, that back in the 60s, they were going to live a life for the world, for the uh -huh. cause, the movement, yeah. the mission. And then, and then just went to work, you know, in a you know, bank. Yes. Uh, eventually. And then tried to rationalize and tell themselves that that was okay because uh, they were doing good things at the bank. Yeah. Uh, and he kind of shames them and says, no, it wasn't okay. Yeah. It wasn't okay at all. It's, it's not, not good enough. You, <laughs> yes, you can you can work at a bank, but you also need to think about what you're doing. Yeah. And if you're not doing the right thing, so he makes them all uncomfortable, is yes. what you're saying. Yes. I think I, I think he absolutely does. I think he makes everyone in Congress in, in, uncomfortable. They don't they don't like him because he, he's willing to he's the only one who's willing to call out the institution. And uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez has this too. One reason that other legislators don't like her is that she's willing to criticize the institution itself. When she got into office, they took all the freshman uh, Congress people up to Harvard to have a uh, an, an indoctrination seminar at the Kennedy School. And she said, well, they were telling us like the minimum wage is bad. And, and she said, is this what they do every every time there's a new class of freshman Congress people? They come and they have all these like economists tell you, well, don't, don't try and do anything radical. And she was the first one to go public and say, you know, this, this is the, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be telling Congress people how they, uh, you know, what kinds of policies they should make. And of course, that makes for people, uh, other people, even people who sort of agree with her, are then shown to have kept it quiet for a long mm. time when clearly it there was nothing stopping them from being better and more courageous people than they actually were. Right. So just her existence, her very existence, mm -hmm. is provides shame to them. <laughs> yes. Because then you start comparing your member of Congress, a Democrat, who isn't doing half of what she's doing. Yeah. She's also a threat because she ran against one of the top Democratic leaders in Congress and primaried him mm -hmm. and beat him yes. in the primary. Yes. So, so as soon as the new Congress took their seats, the Democratic National Committee uh, uh, enacted a new rule uh, that said any any group out there in the states in the 50 states where they work with democratic candidates helping their campaigns you know democratic consultants if you work for any democrat who's primarying an incumbent democrat you will be on the banned list mm -hmm. for the dnc yeah you will not be allowed yes and so and so all the things you know because she's she and and uh, rashida and ilhan have all said they're going to support insurgent oh, yeah. democratic candidates and and they've been told well then we're gonna we're, you're not getting any money then we're gonna shut yeah. you down and we're gonna shut down the people that help yes. you wow you know that, i mean the democratic party is saying right there yes. they know oh yeah that if if people had a real choice, <laughs> they had a choice the primary, they'd probably vote for these people they'd vote for the alexandria ocasio cortezes <laughs> yes. yeah so we gotta and not for yes. uh, you know joe blow from yeah. from you know, Minnesota or whatever. Yeah, because if you really felt that left politics couldn't win, you wouldn't need to rig the game, right? And the fact that they do really tells you all you need to know. But I did realize that if, if, if Bernie won and became president um, and succeeded very strongly in pushing forward, you know, major new social programs, it would really expose the Obama administration as quite a failure, right? Because it would be what they could have and should have done 10 years earlier. So in order to protect his legacy and, I, and to be remembered know. as the healthcare president who gave us half healthcare, um, uh, if Bernie does succeed, 
the legacy, what history will remember is there was one president <laughs> who made sure that every American, yeah, if they got sick, could get help and not have to worry about losing their yeah. home. Yeah, and then what's Obamacare as an accomplishment anymore? <laughs> That's nothing. All I do on the street or any, wherever I am is hear uh, complaints from people, Democrats, yeah, citizens, uh, who hate Obamacare. Oh, I know, yeah. They absolutely hate it, and this isn't, the see, now we're not supposed to say this out loud because it gives the Republicans ammunition, but, but the truth is, if you want to just listen to anybody, they will tell you how much their, their deductibles and co-pays have gone up, how the bronze plan, you know, there's the bronze and the gold, and the, the yeah. platinum plan. Unbelievable that, that the Democrats would have three tiers, would have a class system. Yes, a class system. Some people have bronze. Healthcare. <laughs> yes. Right? You get bronze medicine, bronze doctors. Yeah, you, you know, anybody, the, anybody listening to this right now, you, and you've, if you're at the bronze health plan under Obamacare, <laughs> you're, they're like, fucking A right. This sucks. <laughs> Well, and and I mean, anyone who's tried to use the healthcare marketplaces and you know this this freedom of choice, right? That all the all the free market people want, and and a lot of a lot of Democrats even embrace freedom of choice. That's why we want charter schools. We want people to have a choice. And you try, you know, the reality of choice is in those healthcare market exchanges. When you try and buy, pick out the different plans, and you're like, you know, one of these. You know, they're all different companies and they all have like complicated descriptions of the benefits and they're all specifically designed to try and confuse you into misunderstanding what you get and what you don't. Like that's that's freedom of choice on a marketplace. Right. It's barely even a, a, a half measure is almost generous because like half at least, you know, that implies you did half of it. But like if everyone is still frustrated with their experience of healthcare. It, it's, you know, what you really want, the, the left vision for healthcare is that healthcare operates like the fire department. You know, we have we have socialized firefighting in this country, right? Our, our libraries, right? Our, our libraries. socialism. Yes. When you when you mm. call the fire department, you don't get a bill. It's a government office that comes and does the thing for you. Why? Because we recognize that when your house is on fire, you the only thing you should be thinking about is putting out that fire, not about money. Likewise, when you're sick. And when you're sick, money should be no part of it. No part. It shouldn't be like, you know, it's affordable or whatever. The money should not be on your mind. That is what we are trying to do. And that just isn't part of the liberal vision of healthcare reform, which doesn't see it as like getting money out of it. It sees it as like, you know, well, we'll subsidize. There'll still be a ton of forms to fill out. There'll still be, you still have to pay a monthly premium deductible, but we'll lower it. We'll make sure that there's income testing. And you go, no, the entire point here, like you can imagine the parallel in the fire situation is imagine if like there had been a different trajectory to history and now the firefighting worked like health care works now we'd have private firefighting companies and private firefighting insurance companies to pay for your private firefighting company and the equivalent of obamacare in this situation is to say we're going to subsidize your payments for your private firefighting insurance and there'll be a silver bl bronze and gold plan for our five you go, and the and Medicare for All isn't even a fire department. It's not even as radical as the fire department. A fire department would be the NHS in Britain. That's what right. that is for right. healthcare. That's right. socialized medicine. Right. This is like if we said, well, hey, we'll just have a government fire insurance plan that pays the private firefighting departments, right? <laughs> so paying the private doctors yeah. and the private hospitals. Yeah, exactly. You're right. In the UK, the doctors work for the government. The, the yeah. hospitals are owned by the government. Yes. And when people hear that here, they're like, oh no, you know, and I'm like, no, you don't understand. Uh, the doctors in the UK, I interviewed a bunch of mm. them. For oh my, yeah, of course, movie, sicko, yeah, sicko, and they live a good life. <laughs> you know, if you're a doctor in the UK, yeah. you're not in some shack, no, you know, with cold running water. You live in a nice place. You make a, a good income, and as the one doctor said to me, and I, he takes me on, he shows me his Beamer. You know, he's got his BMW <laughs> there, and. I said, wow, nice car. He says, yeah, but you know, here's the difference between our healthcare system and your healthcare system. I only need one car. <laughs> I don't need three cars. Yeah. And so I'm paid so that I can have a nice house, a nice car, and I can take a vacation a couple times a year. And they're happy uh, with that. And somehow we are, we're so afraid to remove profit motive yeah. from this. 
But the way you explained it, I think, is just perfectly, that is exactly, but the way they ask the questions in the debate always turn into either socialism or how are you going to pay for that? Yeah. You know, it's a, this, you're proposing a $10 trillion whatever. And it's, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, well, how does Portugal pay for it? Because they do it. Yeah. You know? Every, yeah. Or how does, or the larger countries like the UK, France, and Germany, they do it. Well, one reason that it's a, such a stupid and frustrating question with healthcare is that we already pay for it, right? Yes, it's, it, right. It, it, all we're doing is transferring the payments that are already made to insurance companies and having the government take over the administration of paying doctors and hospitals. That's it. There's no how do you pay for it because it's just – through which institution should this money flow? Should this money flow through a private institution that's trying to skim as much off the top as they can and has an incentive to deny care? Or should we just have a centralized agency that collects the money in the form of taxes and then is the single payer? So there, I mean, how do you pay for it is almost a, a sort of meaningless question. We're talking about like how to take existing healthcare spending and reduce it and who should administer existing healthcare spending. It seems so simple. Yes. That, that this would be you think so. the right way to go. It's so dishonest when people who are critics of Medicare for All cite polls. They say, well, yes, everyone loves the term Medicare for All, but then you tell them their taxes are going to go up and they don't love it anymore. So clearly, or you tell them they're going to lose their insurance and they don't love it anymore. So clearly they don't actually love Medicare for All. Well, both of those things are just extremely disingenuous ways of manipulating people into thinking it's something other than what it is, right? Because they say your taxes are going to go up without pointing out that you're going to end up with the whole point is to give you more money in your pocket at the end of the day. Or they say you're going to lose your insurance when actually that implies that you're going to be uninsured. But what we're actually doing is giving you better insurance. So if you ask the poll question, would you like Medicare for all if you ended up with more money and you didn't lose your insurance and in fact your insurance was better at the end of the day, I think everyone would say, yes, of course, I would like that. Right. So you were born in Britain. Yes, I was born in Britain. Um, is it wrong for me not to give a rat's ass anymore about what's going on there <laughs> with the UK, with Brexit, with all well, this Well, yeah, I mean, Brexit is just such a mess that it makes it difficult to know how to interpret British politics or transfer lessons from British politics to American politics. I mean, I, I, I care about what is going on there, especially because, you know, the country has been sort of ravaged by austerity and I was excited to have a Labour Party that had a very serious agenda for turning that around. Um, right. Yeah, this was not Tony Blair. No, uh, it wasn't. His Labour Party. And um, and then Boris Johnson won all those districts where the where the Labour had held those districts for yes. some time. Well... That's pretty depressing. It is depressing. And it's difficult to know what to take away from it because you know, in 2017, Jeremy Corbyn led the Labour Party to increase its vote share by the largest margin since 1945. So he did very, very well in the 2017 election. And he was praised for the party manifesto, which called for renationalizing a lot of the privatized industry and, and you know, expanding NHS spending and people, it was very popular. And in fact, the, the, in a plurality of, uh, in these polls, uh, more young people prefer socialism than capitalism. Right. That's been true now for three or four years. Every time they take the poll, it, the writing's on the wall and it just gets, it goes, they started taking the poll of 18 to 25 year olds and it was 18 to 29, then 18 to 35. Mm -hmm. And the majority of young people, you know, two years from now, be all majority 18 to 40 year olds, uh, believe in socialism and not capitalism. It's a frightening thought to the older people. Right. Uh, you wouldn't think so, considering so many of them grew up in the 60s yeah. uh, when it was all about free stuff, free love, free drugs, free this and that. Free Woodstock was free, you, you know, because the young people just made it free. Yeah. Uh, but now they're all older and they're all like, <laughs> and it really gets me, I got to say this. The people, like when I was of college age, if you went to UC Berkeley or UCLA or you went to the SUNY schools in New York, you didn't pay anything. I mean, you paid for your books. There were there was a, a filing fee for the mm -hmm. whatever, but that was it. It was essentially free college. Yes. 
in, throughout the country and in places like in Michigan, maybe yeah. the University of Michigan, it might have been a thousand bucks a year, two thousand a year. <laughs> you know, and for anybody listening to this who is, you know, say over the age of 50 or 55, who got to grow up in a system where you got to go to college for free or nearly free, to not support that now for the younger generation, for your kids and your grandkids, who the hell are you? <laughs> What's incredible about so many of the things that are considered radical is not just that, and, and utopian, is not just that they exist in other countries, as, you know, where to invade next. You went around and looked at all the things that actually exist right now in other countries that we could do and choose not to, but some of them have existed even here before, you know, places that have had a free college and then have rolled it back, right? I, <laughs> and my dad's health care, because he belonged to the union, the UAW, right. the War yeah, Auto Workers thing. Union, his, his health, I remember as a kid, everything was free. There was no copay. There was no mm -hmm. deductible. All visits to the doctor in the hospital were free. Mm -hmm. um, he had four weeks paid vacation as an assembly line worker yeah. making spark. Plugs. Pensions were a thing I hear. Let me define the word to anyone who just heard that <laughs> yeah. word and doesn't know what it means, that in addition to your social security, your employer put money away for you. Every year that like you work. Like you just get it and you didn't have to work You anymore? didn't have to do anything but just show up to work and automatically uh, uh, a couple thousand dollars a year and then it grew uh, and then it was thousands of dollars a year would be put away for you for when you get older and then it's free money uh, 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 when you take it out. Uh, of course you will have to pay your income tax, but other than that, it's yours. That's gone. Mm -hmm. In fact, those who had pensions in the last 10 years saw the pensions taken away from mm -hmm. them and all the money that was put in over the years right. went up in smoke. Um, and it's, it's so ironic to see the, the Bernie's lowest numbers <laughs> being in people that got all the free stuff, mm -hmm. the free college, the free healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, the the <laughs> libraries, the free libraries, which were everywhere in every neighborhood, mm -hmm. open morning, noon, and night, seven days a week. You can go to the library. You know, you're lucky now mm -hmm. um, if, if it's open uh, two days a week for half a day. Mm -hmm. um, all that stuff that we benefited from, um, why we aren't demanding it for our own children and grandchildren, uh, shows a certain level of narcissism. Mm -hmm. And as Trump is a boomer, mm -hmm. his narcissism to me, I mean, yes, we can point out the malignant narcissism, narcissism mm -hmm. piece of this, but, but he really is of a generation that, yes, it's, it was good for me and I took what I could take and I'm sorry, I don't have to give it to you now. Right. Um, but this is, you know, say, well, you're a socialist, you're called a socialist. And, and you, so you've written a book here right. uh, recently uh, entitled, uh, why you should be a socialist, or if I could, if I could say the title in the way that the uh, the font and the size of the font is used on the cover, why you <laughs> should be a socialist. Um, <laughs> how'd I do? Yeah, that's great. I I didn't ask that to make the you the biggest, but it it did come out the biggest. So now it's very accusatory and uh, oh, demanding. I said, no, no, I said it accusatory. Actually, let me do it again. <laughs> let me do it again. Why you should be <laughs> a seductive. socialist. Well, because your book yes. points out why, how your life will be so much better, page after page yeah. after page. If we just did, we're not talking about Soviet Union stuff here, folks. No. We're talking about the social democracies, essentially, of Europe, of, of Australia, of uh, um, uh, Japan to a, a large extent. Um, and they have capitalist enterprises in these countries. But... They don't form the social, the well-being of their people around the concept of profit. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, so people talk about, you know, what is socialism just social democracy, but it's really capitalism. And that's a lot of people who try and defend things as they currently are want to say, well, you know, the social democratic countries you talk about, that's not socialism. It's just capitalism. Well, one point is the the point that you make, which is, well, it's, a, it, it's still very different. They still have much more, many more socialized institutions. It, it is true that socialists, people who rally under the, uh, the banner of socialism, um, you know, they go a little beyond that. You know, we don't think that, you know, contemporary Scandinavia is necessarily the, the, 
the ultimate uh, highest form of, of human society that we could ever hope to reach. Um, we have a sort of a fundamental um, critique of the division between a small owning class and a large working class. And that sort of separates someone from uh, who is a socialist from someone who is just a social democratic progressive. So socialists have always had this very, very deep critique that says, well, you need people to feel ownership over their workplaces. You need to not have a small number of people who are extremely rich and powerful, even if they provide some semblance of a welfare state. But is is that how you define socialism? Yeah, I mean, I, if well, you, if, yeah. what do you say to people when they come up to you and then they'll say, well, how do you define us? In a sentence or two, how would you define uh, socialism? Well, I talk first about the socialist ethic that I think socialists share, which is, it, it can be captured in that Eugene Debs quote, that great quote, while there's a lower class, I am in it, and while there's a criminal element, I am of it, and while there's a soul in prison, I am not free. And that is an incredible quote because it's so radical when you think about it. It says that my freedom is tied to however the condition is of the person who's at the bottom, which is to say, as long as there are, is, a, see, he says, a soul in prison, I don't feel fully free. So until we figure out how to build a world that doesn't have prisons at all, I can't f achieve full freedom. Now, that's remarkable. And I think what socialists have in common is that they don't just believe that we should have sort of a basic standard of living for you know, subsistence provided, which we do believe and we're strongly pushing for, and that would be an incredible advance in the United States. But socialism is a kind of very long-term human aspiration that says we always need to look at the gap between what society is and what it could be. And we always need to look at the condition of the people who are at the very bottom and at the very top. And we need to see what the relationships between those people are and have a world ultimately that doesn't have any exploitation or unnecessary hierarchy in it. So we can define the word for ourselves mm -hmm. in 2020. I mean, it doesn't have to be part of some historic way because the word's been used in all sorts of ways. Yes. <laughs> like Christianity. Yeah. I mean, the Eugene Debs quote sure. is essentially a version of Jesus in the New Testament sure. saying the same thing. Some One of his apostles said to him, hey, dude, because um, we're your apostles, can you give us like, is there a password or something to get us into heaven, you know, so we can skip uh -huh. the line? Um, and then he says, ah, oh, well, actually there is, and I will, I will give it to you. Um, if, if, if you, when I was in prison and you came to see me, you were, you felt you were part of me, then you get in. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was homeless, if you gave me a roof over my head, uh, you get in. Yeah. Uh, when I was sick and you healed me, you get in. Uh, and if you do that for anybody, especially the least people, the people who make the least money who have it the worst then you're gold. You get, you go in the easy pass line. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that is a fundamental written, uh, part of what Christianity is supposed to be mm -hmm. yet. And yet, and yet <laughs> somehow, somehow a lot of people through the ages, who call themselves Christians who don't, I, I, I'm pretty sure they don't, they don't feel part of, uh, people who are <laughs> no, in prison and, or sleeping on the streets. And uh, and Christians have killed millions of people in the last 2,000 years. So uh, so the way the word is used isn't necessarily the way that it was either meant to be by the originators of it or and certainly by the practitioners of it who just used it for their own purposes. But, yeah. you know, what do you say to people? Because especially as you know now in this country, it's it still has this kind of weird bugaboo Yes. About it. And, yeah. And to me, I just, you know, I just say what you just said. And, and well, here's what it really means. And who wouldn't support right. that? Yeah. Um, it's true. That, you know, so The history of socialism is in, in part a history of an argument between socialists over who's the real socialist and what it, and what it means. And um, so it's a it's a political tradition that has many, many strands to it. Um, but there is something that has been noble and, and great in the tradition of socialism that we can reclaim. And I 
used to wonder whether it was worth saving the word. When I was younger, I thought, you know, do we, do we want to try and reclaim and convince people that the word socialism is, or sh should we just rebranch? We just call ourselves the left, the progressive left. But I like the word because as you read the history of socialism, you realize that there were so many great people who did rally under that banner and that we shouldn't be ashamed of it or accept that it means the USSR at its worst uh, when it also means people like Helen Keller and it also means people like Albert Einstein. Um, you know, Helen Keller said, you know, I, she has, she has, I quote her extensively in the book because she was a real radical socialist. She took it seriously and it's kind of an insult to her that no one discusses her socialism. And, uh, and she was insulted at the time. She said, I may be blind and deaf, but I'm not blind and deaf to exploitation and injustice. And, and, and she really resented when people portrayed her as a genius for her accomplishments. But then when she started to talk about socialism and the importance of taking on the class of people who owned everything, uh, then they said, well, she's, that's probably just because she's blind and deaf and she doesn't understand economics, right? Um, there are all these great socialists that I talk about in the book. And, um, and I do think that it's a, it's a tradition worth getting acquainted with and, and being proud of and, and, and embracing because ultimately the analysis that socialists have of the world explains the world very accurately, right? Bernie Sanders looks at people's problems and he has a story for them that is that is true instead of a story that is false like what Trump has and it's also the only political tradition and philosophy that can possibly hope to offer real solutions because it has an aspiration to a world where you know when you go to school you don't have to get into tens of thousands of dollars in debt when you go to the doctor you just go to the doctor um, you know there are great commonly owned public things. I mean, the reason that common or public ownership is so important to socialism is because we recognize that when we all own things together, like the libraries, you know, then it, they don't operate in narrow private interests and everyone can enjoy them regardless of their, of their economic status. And that when we have democratic workplaces, your experience at work is a better experience. Everyone should get to participate. People shouldn't have to be taking orders from, from tyrants who don't understand their work and, and who bully and, and, uh, and harass them. Um, these are the things that socialists have always aspired to. And when you tell people about them, um, because most people experience the kinds of problems that we are addressing, um, they agree. And that's one of the reasons why in order to keep people from being socialist, you have to spread such uh, pernicious myths and lies about them. I mean, George Orwell said from a certain perspective, uh, uh, you know, he was a very firm socialist all his life, even though uh, people portray him as you know, just being an anti-communist. Uh, but he was always very firm on his socialism because he said socialism really is just common sense. And you know when you when you think about it, the Earth is like a raft sailing through space with plenty enough provisions for all. And so, why would we not make sure that everyone had an adequate supply and that everyone shared equally in mm. the prosperity of this incredible world that we found ourselves in? It seems like the kind and fair thing to do. You'd if, think so, wouldn't you? Well, <laughs> I would think if you were of a mind that where you cared about your fellow woman, man, child. Uh, that's exactly the position you take on these issues. Unfortunately, caring about people is a radical stance in 21st century capitalist America. Mm. I saw an op-ed in the New York Times by a couple that lives in Finland. They went there to live. And, mm. Oh, and yes. They talked about how just they, all this, the, the daycare that was, you know, I don't know, a dollar an hour, <laughs> everything that was free and everything that was provided for the people. Um, but the headline and what their point they wanted to make is, is that capitalism can thrive in a quote socialist yeah. setting. Did you read that? Uh, yeah, I did. It, it, I mean, it's, cause it it's made little, me feel uncomfortable. It's a little frustrating because I think that they are using capitalism in a very different way than all of the defenders of capitalism use it. When defenders of capitalism use it, they really mean a prioritization of self-interest, of profit, lack of, you know, lack of any sort of regulation on the activities of business. People who embrace capitalism really are pushing us 
in a less socialized direction. So there's a bit of a contradiction between saying that these things, which are socialized institutions in Finland, they are things that are that are that operate for the benefit of all and are owned by all, which is sort of the definition of economic socialism. So you say like, you know, more socialism can make capitalism better. Well, you you know, you the people who in, are running under the banner of capitalism are always trying to destroy the very institutions that you're talking about. And until you get rid of the kind of mentality that is referred to by the word capitalism, by people like Milton Friedman, or the thing that they're talking about when they talk about capitalism, until you rid your society of that entirely, uh, even to the extent that you build good, strong, socialized institutions in a place like Finland, they're always going to be trying to privatize and destroy them and make sure that someone's making a buck off them. The, when I was in Finland, um, the, I, I uh, filmed an interview with the Minister of Education and she said to me that, uh, I said, well, where are the better schools? You know, like, where's the, you must have a ranking of, mm-hmm. these are the best schools. Like, mm-hmm. these are the best colleges in the U.S. She said, there's no such thing here. I said, oh, come on. She says, no, no, really. First of all, we do not allow private schools. Mm-hmm. I said, you're kidding me. You mean, like, you don't have, like, a Harvard or a Yale? Yeah. She said, oh, no, no, we have Harvard and Yale. That's all of our colleges. <laughs> all of our public yeah. colleges are Harvards and Yales. Right. And and we make sure that no uh, one college has it better, right. has a better science lab or a better this or that than the other colleges. Yeah. So if you live up in Lapland, mm-hmm. you know, with the reindeer and Santa, yeah. whatever, you're going to go to an institution, you know, university that's every bit as good as the university in downtown Helsinki. Mm-hmm. Um, I was amazed at that. I said, so you don't even that private like grade schools or high yeah. schools? No, no, we will allow the occasional religious school because of our respect yeah, sure. for religious rights and they, if they insist, but they still have to follow the public school yeah. uh, curriculum. But, but that way she says the rich can't just send, yeah. they, they, you know, they send their kids to the private schools. They don't have to worry about all the rest. When they, when the rich know that their kids have got to go to the public school, they make, they become part of it and they make damn sure those schools are going to be good because they don't have another choice. This is an important component of what distinguishes socialists from sort of mere progressive capitalists is that socialists have always said, they've used the phrase, nothing's too good for the working class. And the aspiration has always been that the it's not just that you should set a floor and that everyone should get the the, the bare right. minimum. So everyone gets an okay public school, but if you have a lot of wealth, you can put your kids in a, in a way better school. It's that everyone is equal in their, not just in like their opportunity, but in like everyone gets an equal school. And there's, you know, if you if you look at sort of Obama administration education policy that was all about competition and, and getting kids, getting the most promising kids into the best schools, you know, that kind of logic we reject because as you say, there shouldn't be best schools. There should be great schools every school should be an incredible school but we want to raise everyone to the top and this is another thing that's very important which is that like you know, socialists are often dismissed as uh, you know wanting a, a life of deprivation for people the equal sharing of miseries but i'm a kind of you know i kind of like the label champagne socialism right and and the uh, the the old phrase you know the, the worker must have bread but she must have roses too and the de- the democratic socialist of america symbol it's not a loaf of bread it's a rose because we recognize that you must have good and beautiful things you don't just want public libraries you want amazing public libraries you want the best libraries in the world you don't just want basic health care everyone should have the best healthcare that we are capable of providing. And that's possible. And, and it's possible. And to say we don't have the money for it. Ah, it's crap. <laughs> it is crap because, first of all, we don't tax the rich and these corporations the way they tax them on the other democracies. And that's how they're able to pay for this. If we don't he, tax them the way we used to here in this country. You, if you want to know if we have the money for things, and if you want to make the argument we don't have enough money, you need to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal and you need to open it on a Friday to their real estate section, which is called Mansion. And it profiles all of the houses that the very, very ultra rich are buying this week. 
And it says, you know, 100 million is the new 10 million for housing you know, places with a 30 car garage, five kitchens. You know, they ran a, an article, headline article, front page, which was how to move your 10,000 square foot house when the sea levels rise, you know, your coastal house. And they showed how you could put wow. it on a trailer and, and, and get it away so you can still have a 10,000 square foot house. It's very difficult to see things like that or to see the $120,000 paid for a banana taped to a wall that was art. Um, and to see those sort of things and to, and to take seriously at all the argument that we can't at least do much, much better than we are doing now. Well, I certainly believe that. And, uh, and I think, you know, part of what you're doing, <clears throat> what all of us should be doing, is to knock down these lies and to, and to educate people yeah. about just how good it can be. We don't, have, we don't have to live this miserable life, and we don't have to have so many people struggling day-to-day uh, -day for their survival. Well, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned sort of educating people, getting the message out, because <laughs> in many ways that the way that I write is drawn from, I mean, I watched a lot of your movies in, in high school and in college, and the, were, one of the things that I drew from that was that we have to have media we have to have something that shows people the alternative very clearly. And we ha also have to have it in a way that political thinking and political ideas don't feel like having to eat your vegetables, right? They have to be entertaining. They have to be human and engaging. And that was something that I think you really brought to film that I'm now trying to do in magazines is to make a magazine that actually feels you know, readable. <laughs> And, and, to, and, to sh and to show people something that is very clear and intelligible and, and lays out like, this is what's going wrong, but it doesn't have to. And that's something that often they haven't heard before. And it's, it's very powerful when you, when, you, when you start to raise these ideas. Well, your magazine, Current Affairs, is not only highly readable, it's inspiring. And um, I thank you for doing it. And I encourage uh, people listening uh, to subscribe, uh, if you you know can't subscribe, uh, um, there's you can read uh, it online. You can mm -hmm. um, steal a copy from somebody. I don't you know, could just, whatever it you is. You could theoretically by any means necessary. Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, anyway, just say yes. Any means is fine. You're going to yes. be fine. We're, I, we're fine. I'm going to be fine. We're all going to. We fine. would appreciate it if you have the money to subscribe. We would appreciate it. But okay. yeah, no, yes, yeah, if you do, thing. yes, I don't care. I steal a thing. Okay, I'll just then I'll speak for myself. If there, if you can pirate <laughs> my movies in any way possible, you have my permission to do that. I'm thrilled yes. that you do that. Thank you, but but thank you for this, and I I will continue to be a, a reader and a subscriber, and uh, I bought a subscription for all my my uh, crew there in my uh, movie and uh the last movie and and they all still read it and i'm reminding them now they have to renew so um yeah always gotta renew but uh but uh this is a it's a real gift uh to us to have current affairs and this book why you should be a socialist yeah, check out the book. um man it's all there it really it gives you'll be able to answer every argument uh presented to you um from your parents uh to uh, some Want to be know it all that <laughs> thinks uh, he's got it all figured out, yes. and why the profit motive is runs runs through our veins like the the blood of our democracy. When capitalism is obviously anything but democracy, so my hope is it'll be it'll be amusing to give this book to right wing relatives as well. Um, yes. See the reaction with a heart. With a heart. Draw a little heart. I want the, the best for you. Yes, I want please. you to come and join us yes. on the left. It's going to be so much better. We're nice people. Your stress level is going to go way down when you don't have to worry about things you shouldn't be worrying about. Yeah, absolutely. So we're here to help. It's a welcoming mm -hmm. book. I really tried to write something that I think even no, people disagree with. No, it is. It's very, with, you know. that's, it's very, it, this is not a diatribe. It's not a tract. It's, it's, it's uh, a very fun and enjoyable read thank you for writing it yeah. uh, thank you for being here on all rumble right. and uh and uh let's talk again in the future yeah here. absolutely all right nathan robinson thank you appreciate it